All right. Okay, thank you. Please be seated. The court will call the matter of State of Wisconsin versus Morgan E. Geyser, case number 14 CF 596. Appearances. State by Ted Sapak, Woodson, Kevin Osborne. Thank you and good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Attorneys Anthony Cotton and Donna Kukler with uh, our consultant Rob Rosenberg and Morgan Geyser here in person. All right, thank you and good morning. The uh, case is here this morning for, for uh, uh, sentencing and disposition on the uh, proceedings. <coughs> the, is the state prepared to proceed? Yes. And is the defense prepared to proceed? Yes, just one housekeeping matter before we begin. Yes. Uh, ask that Ms. Geyser not be shackled for the hearing, Your Honor, or that uh, her hand shackles be removed. Well, in the past, it's, we've left it up to the sheriff. If the sheriff believes it's appropriate, they can uh, remove the cuffs from her hands in case she wants to take notes. Um, they've indicated no, so her, her feet are shackled too. Well, I think that's appropriate security. Okay. Security is the responsibility of the, the sheriff's department. We, I give them the ability to make decisions within reasonable bounds. Very good. All right. Thank you. I just need to uh, make a couple adjustments. All right. Very good. I have the uh, computer set up so I can function from that standpoint. What I wanted to do is just make a, uh, a brief statement about the case, putting the case in the context for our proceedings this morning. <clears throat> the, uh, the matter involving Morgan Geyser is before the court this morning based upon a two-phase proceeding. An initial plea of not guilty was entered to the charge of the information, which is one of attempted first-degree intentional homicide, party to a crime with a dangerous weapon. And then a second a plea was entered of not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. The matters were set for a jury trial on both the criminal charge and on the NGI plea. On October 5, 2017, Ms. Geyser entered a plea of guilty to the amended information of attempted first degree intentional homicide party to the crime. The enhancer with a dangerous weapon was struck. She was found guilty of that offense based upon the plea. Further, the state and Ms. Geyser agreed that the court could use the reports that had been submitted with regard to the uh, not guilty by reason of mental disease and defect plea as a basis to proceed. Based upon those reports, I found the report sufficient and then found Ms. Geyser not guilty of the offense by reason of mental disease or defect. And I made that finding by uh, clear and convincing evidence. The jury trial was removed from the court calendar on both, on both issues. The court then ordered the department to submit a predispositional report and further ordered that doctors Lundbone and Bernie prepare supplemental reports. They had prepared reports previously with regard to the issues. These reports have been received. The matter was then set for a dispositional sentencing hearing to today's date and we're here for that process. The maximum sentence on the criminal charge is 60 years imprisonment, which breaks down to 40 years of initial confinement, 20 years of extended supervision. The case proceeds on the commitment, on the commitment basis, with the maximum commitment being 40 years. <clears throat> Previously, the uh, state had recommended that they would pursue a maximum commitment of 40 years and institutional placement. Uh, Ms. Geyser is free to argue for conditional release and other dispositions. The, uh, under the Wisconsin statute 971.17 sub 1 sub B states that upon an NGI finding, the court shall commit the person to the Department of Health Services for a period not exceeding the maximum period of confinement, which in this case would be 40 years. The court entered that initial commitment. The Ms. Geyser is further is also civilly committed based upon other proceedings that have taken place and based upon that commitment and orders of the court, she resides at the Winnebago Mental Health Institute. The court has read the reports of uh, Drs. Lundbu and Bernie. I 
read the predispositional report. I have a report from Dr. Robbins, and I have the victim impact statement submitted by Ms. Lautner. With that, then, the court is prepared to proceed. How does the state wish to proceed? Judge, first, you should also have a victim impact statement from Joseph Lautner, the father. Let me file by our office, I believe, somewhere around January 19th. Yeah, I have a victim impact statement filed by Stacey Lautner that was filed on January 19th. I have a statement. I have another victim impact statement filed on December 21st that was filed by, signed by Stacey Lautner as well. So is there another document out there I should see? It's possible, Judge, that the one from the January 19th date was perhaps mislabeled, but it is signed by Mr. Lautner. I can certainly e-file that again. Well, the one I have filed on the 19th is signed by Stacey Lautner. And it appears to be an exact copy of what was filed in December. So perhaps there was an inadvertent misfiling. That's certainly possible, Judge. We will... If you want to do it, file it now. I'll read it. We'll do that as we go along, Judge, so it's available to the court at some point today. We certainly want you to be able to read that and consider it. All right. Very good. That's fine. I'll certainly do that. Does the, does Ms. Geiser's attorneys have a copy of the Joseph Lautner document? We do not. All right. So then, well, when it's e-filed, it should go to all attorneys. Right. So when it's e-filed, then Mr. Conson and Ms. Kugler should have it as well. I'm logged in electronically and just looking. I don't see it in the system. All right. Well, we'll proceed on that basis then. The state will file it, and I'll read it before I reach any final conclusions in the case. I want then Mr. Conson to have it as well, so he, during his presentation, can be in a position to appropriately respond. With that being said, then, is the state prepared to proceed at this point? I am, Judge. I'm prepared to call Dr. Brooke Lundbaum. All right. Dr. Lundbaum, are you here? I am. Yeah. All right. If you'd come forward. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. And then if you'd be seated and state your full name and spell your last name. My name is Dr. Brooke Lundbaum. My last name is spelled L-U-N-D-B-O-H-M. All right. Thank you. Just before we begin, I just want to make a couple other adjustments. Yes. All right. I'm prepared. Very good. Thank you. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. How are you employed? I'm currently employed as a licensed psychologist. I am licensed through the state of Wisconsin, and I have a private practice through Behavioral Consultants Incorporated. I also am the clinical director for a Department of Human Services program called the Outpatient Competency Restoration Program, or OCRP. Is that the Competency Restoration Program, do you do that only within Milwaukee County, or? That's statewide. Okay. For adult offenders. Okay. How long have you been employed in that capacity? I'm not sure. I've been there a couple years now, so probably about two, maybe a little bit longer than that. With the Competency Restoration? Right. I was previously employed with Wisconsin Forensic Unit doing competency evaluations prior to taking on that role. There's a difference between the Wisconsin Forensics Unit and Behavioral Consultants? The Wisconsin Forensic Unit is a subset of Behavioral Consultants. It's a wing, if you will. 
Okay. How long have you been with behavioral consultants? I started with them in 2008 as a postdoctoral forensic psychology fellow. When I was in li licensed in 2009, I began my employment with them. I've been with them since. And can you very briefly just outline for us your educational background? Sure. I have my doctorate degree from the Minnesota School of Professional Psychology, received that degree in 2008. Um, while en route to finishing that, I have my master's degree from that same school, finishing that in 2006. My bachelor degree came from a school called Hamilton College uh, in 2002. I completed a one-year pre-doctoral internship at the Mendota Mental Health Institute. That was my final year of school. And then, as mentioned, completed a one-year postdoctoral forensic psychology fellowship through the Behavioral Consultants and Wisconsin Forensic Unit. That was 2008 to 2009. And through your employment with behavioral consultants, what percentage of what you do is um, court-appointed evaluations? Almost all. Okay. And it's been that way since 2009? Right. And you've obviously been appointed in this case going way back to 2014, is that right? Right. And what did you do in this case in 2014? I was initially assigned through my employment with Wisconsin Forensic Unit to do a competency examination of Morgan. And initially, when you did that examination, you found her to not be competent, is that right? Correct. Um, you weren't involved in administering any restoration to competency with Morgan, were you? Correct. I was not involved. Okay. Did you, were you called upon to do a later evaluation as to whether or not she had become competent? I was not. <clears throat> okay. So your next involvement in this case was um, a request by the court to do an evaluation as to whether or not she met the standards for being found not guilty by reason of mental disease? Correct. And what were your findings in that regard? I was in support of her special plea. Can you, I know that's not the issue for today, but briefly tell us why you came to that conclusion. Well, in review of the totality of evidence, which include conversation, a clinical interview with uh, Morgan, as well as review of a variety of records related to that particular time frame, um, including discovery materials, medical records following uh, the actual offense, it was my opinion that she was suffering under the effects of a psychotic spectrum disorder at the time that the offense occurred. And you had authored a report to that effect um, well, actually, you, you did an evaluation of Morgan on November 7th of 2016, is that right? I believe the report was submitted to the court on November 7th, 2016. And you were also then asked by the court to um, now come forth with an opinion as to whether or not conditional release would be appropriate? Correct. And. You did author a report in that regard, right? Correct. And that's dated November 20th of 2017? That's correct. You have that in front of you today? I do. Okay. Um, so you had met with Morgan last sometime perhaps in November of 2016, is that right? In, with respect Try to this current evaluation? No, with respect to the NGI evaluation. If I could just look, I can tell you exact dates. Okay. With respect to the mental responsibility evaluation, I met with Morgan at the Winnebago Mental Health Institute on September 9th, 2016, and September 13th, 2016. And then now, after having been called upon to do an evaluation as to conditional release, you met with her on October 26th, 2017. Is that right? Correct. So roughly a year and a month had gone by between times you had seen Morgan. Is that right? Correct. And for purposes of this evaluation regarding conditional release, um, you reviewed all of the records that were maintained at Winnebago, is that right? Correct. As well as 
all the records you had previously um, looked at for your other valuations. Is that true? Correct. In the report you just authored regarding conditional release, you found that Morgan has made some progress. Is that fair to say? Yes. Can you describe what you've noticed as far as progress she's made? Well, since the various evaluations that I've done, uh, Morgan has noticeably displayed greater psychiatric stability, especially within the context of my very first contact with her um, in the wake of the actual offense. Uh, that being said, while she's definitely benefited from the use of psychotropic medications, she continues to demonstrate symptoms of both, psycho of both a psychosis but also of what appears to be a post-traumatic stress syndrome that includes depression and anxiety. And what do you rely upon to say that she continues to show some symptoms? That's based upon her self-report during our clinical interview as well as my observations during our clinical interview, but also by review of a variety of documents related to her um, institutional care, her treatment happening at Winnebago. In terms of her self-report, um, when did she indicate to you, when you interviewed her on October 26th, was the last time she had had some, I guess I'll call it hallucination, but if you can Put it however you would phrase it. She had reported that she had last heard an auditory hallucination of a voice that she calls Maggie just a few weeks before our contact. A few weeks prior to October 26th. Correct. And in your review of the notes from her care at Winnebago, did you <coughs> find anything in there that indicated that she still showed symptoms? Her records are quite interesting, actually, when it comes to the specific symptoms related to psychosis. Uh, when looking at her records, particularly over that year and one month time frame since when I last have seen her, uh, the first several months describe her as consistently complaining of auditory hallucinations, especially related to this voice that she names Maggie. Um, it was in about, I believe, March of 2017. Um, and I can just look here to make sure. In about March of 2017, her treating psychiatrist made some changes to her medication regimen such that she's now prescribed Haldol, which is an antipsychotic medication. And with the use of that agent, her description of hearing that voice has um, reduced. She's saying that she still hears that voice periodically. It's less intense, less frequent, and that's the same report that she provided to me in October uh, while we were meeting for this evaluation. And as mentioned, said that she last heard that voice of, Ma of Maggie just a few weeks prior to when we were meeting. And you mentioned that after the medication <coughs> change to the Haldol, that Maggie at least became less intense? C correct. Meaning what? The way that she describes it, uh, that voice became less menacing, less mean, less frequent. She had previously been reporting hearing this particular voice several t up to several times a day. Uh, it was relatively frequent, causing her quite a bit of distress. Uh, once Haldol was added to the medication regimen, they made some changes to those actual prescribed psychotropic medications for Sure, they had made some changes to the psychotropic medications specific to psychosis, and with Haldol, her report of that voice has greatly diminished, although still present. In looking at the records, you were able to determine that medication changes have occurred regularly. Would that be fair to yes. say? Um, in fact, when was the last medication change that you were aware of? It appeared that there were medication ha changes happening um, even within the weeks prior to my contact. I'm just looking at my report here. Uh, in June of 2017, her psychiatrist added Topamax 
to her medication regimen. Shortly after that, a few weeks later, added clonopin, which is an anti-anxiety medication. And then there was notation, um, excuse me, notation from September 2017, indicating that her psychiatrist had begun tapering her from one of her anti uh, antidepressant agents, uh, which is called Celexa. So as recent as September of 2017, there was a, a change in medication. Is that true? Correct. You also did conduct an interview with Morgan, you mentioned, in preparation of this report. Is that right? That's right. And that, again, was on October 26, 2017? Correct. Can you describe for the court um, some of the things that occurred during that interview? Well, to summarize, most notably, Morgan had difficulty uh, maintaining her emotional composure during that interview. Uh, as the interview progressed, she became uh, overwhelmed, distraught even. Eventually, while discussing some of the issues related to her conditional release, uh, she was crying so hard that she was having difficulty communicating. I gave her several minutes to try to regain her emotional composure. She eventually decided to terminate the interview um, because of the distress she was ex experiencing during those moments. Well, what issues related to conditional release brought that upon Morgan? At that point, we were discussing what her plans were if she were to be granted conditional release. Um, in response to some of her of her ideas, I had pushed back mildly about the realistic nature and some of the challenges that she might face um, given her particular circumstances. In response to my mild pressure and pushing back saying, you know, that some of these ideas may not work, she became um, overwhelmed. She was complaining that she didn't know how she wanted me to, or how, how I wanted her to answer um, and became very tearful. Well, do you recall what some of those ideas that you, I guess, challenged her on, saying they wouldn't work, um, were discussed? I had asked her where she planned to live, um, should she be released, and uh, as you can imagine, given her age, um, indicated a plan to return toward, uh, to the home with her mother and father. Said, uh, I asked her how she planned to spend her time. She indicated intent to basically spend the majority of time with her family and her cats. Um, in response to questioning about what kind of services or what kind of supports she might need um, to ensure that uh, things are going well for her in the community and that she remains psychiatrically stable, uh, she denied belief that she de would need any supports um, outside of her immediate family. Uh, pushing back on that, saying that that wasn't realistic given what conditional release typically includes, um, became mildly defiant and irritable. Um, eventually she had stated that she uh, just wouldn't leave the home when I had confronted with her with some of the potential challenges she might face given the high profile nature of her charge and some of the negative stigma that might be attached once she returns to the community. Um, and it was about this point where she became um, increasingly tearful, more difficult to engage in productive conversation. Around this time I switched the conversation toward um, how she might know if she was struggling and needed more supports and more help around her and she indicated a plan to rely upon her mother um, to notice if her mental health was decompensating uh, which is concerning given the history where she became quite mentally ill was acutely symptomatic up to the index offense without people closest to her recognizing that her mental health was deteriorating. Did you ever interview um, her mother, Angie Geyser? I did uh, during other parts of the evaluation process. So not for this particular evaluation, but in the past. And they had no indication whatsoever that Morgan was as psychologically unstable as she was. Right. It was a, an offense um, that took her family especially by surprise. It was completely out of character for her. Um, th and then the symptoms that were revealed following her arrest uh, were quite striking and surprising. 
when Morgan became overwhelmed and couldn't continue with your interview, was, was that how your interview ended with her? It was. Ultimately, Dr. Lundbaum, you um, offer the opinion to the court that Morgan should not be conditionally released. Is that right? That's correct. And I know there's a number of reasons or <clears throat> ways you arrive at that conclusion. If you could summarize those, please. Briefly to, to summarize, because it's a lot of information here. Um, one of the things mostly driving my opinion is that um, when considering Morgan's risk for reoffense or violence um, or additional criminal acts, the evidence suggests that her mental health um, is of primary importance. She committed a near lethal, very serious act of violence towards somebody that was closest to her, her be who, somebody who she considered to be her best friend within that context of psychosis that was well hidden from people around her. Uh, because of that, I'm very concerned that she's not symptom free, that she continues to endorse not only psychotic symptomatology in terms of hearing voices, but also there's a layer of emotional dysregulation dysregula um, in terms of anxiety, depression. She admits to having quite a number of um, what she calls flashes of the offense that occurred and avoidance of dealing with any of it, um, trying hard to ignore that these events actually occurred and they're disrupting um, her adaptive functioning, her day-to-day -day functioning. Well, just as to that point, doctor, I know you you did specifically discuss that with her and did she make any comments to you about um, feeling bad for uh, the victim, Peyton, in this case, and kind of wishing they could just go back to being friends and that had, none of this had happened? Yes, she has quite a bit of remorse related to this offense. And what you've just described could be characterized certainly as some post-traumatic stress related to the offense itself. Is that true? It appears to be on that spectrum, yes. Okay, and I apologize, I interrupted you summarizing how you arrived at your conclusion. If you can continue that, please. Uh, to briefly summarize, uh, Morgan's an individual who requires additional intervention, um, additional therapy, as well as um, continued intervention in terms of working with a psychiatrist to find an effective medication regimen that manages her psychotic symptoms as well as her emotional symptoms and also manages side effects that occur because of all of this. At this point, she continues to work with her psychiatrist to find an effective re medication regimen, um, but it's a work in progress. They were continuing to make adjustments to the medication regimen up until the time that I was um, evaluating her for this particular evaluation and all of the information through the records at Winnebago as well as my own observations suggests that she continues to experience quite significant symptoms that are not yet uh, remediated. When you met with her in late October of 2017, she had just recently been transferred to a different unit at Winnebago? Yes, three days before our contact. And do you believe that offered enough time to really evaluate how she would respond to that new unit? No, she had actually just met with her treatment uh, team for that unit on the morning of our contact. Um, so they had very little knowledge of her on that unit other than the information that they had received through her chart. Uh, but in terms of personally knowing her staff at that particular unit were unfamiliar with her. Um, she had not yet had the opportunity to begin any form of treatment on that unit, including attending treatment mall unit, um, sorry, uh, groups at the treatment mall, as well as groups occurring on that particular unit. She was not familiar with the uh, phase and level system attached to that particular unit in terms of what she would need to do to get more privileges, um, have more opportunity of um, freedom. She was just getting her feet underneath her when I saw her. 
um, excited to be there, excited to be moving on to the next phase of the treatment program, but relatively unaware of what that actually might include. And is, was that important to your conclusion, the uncertainty as to how she would respond to this new unit? Certainly the uncertainty of that, as well as uh, throughout her entire stay at Winnebago, she had been on what's considered their most restrictive setting. And indeed, up until just a few months before our contact, had been on a one-to-one -one staff supervised um, condition where a staff member had to be within two arms lengths of her. So the supervision and support that she was receiving was quite significant. Um, and so to suggest that she might be able to handle less severe or less uh, significant monitoring is quite concerning given that she was struggling to cope with the little bits of uh, privilege and freedom that she was experiencing uh, as she was going along. And without knowing how she would respond to that, there's makes it very difficult to assess whether conditional release, which would include even much more freedom, would work or not. Is that fair? Well, one of the things that I considered is in looking back through her history, there seems to be a pattern where when she was um, discharged to less supportive and therapeutic and monitored settings like the detention center, there was a deterioration in her mental health such that she was then brought back to the Winnebago Mental Health Institute. And so it's concerning that previous efforts to put her into a different environment were unsuccessful because of Winnebago at this point seems to be beneficial to her. Well, and when she went back to secure at those times, she refused to take medications also, isn't that true? I don't recall. I, I, from the records, I recall that on one occasion she was not being treated um, and because of that was not doing well. That prompted her return to Winnebago. Um, I believe with this third admission, the records that I reviewed suggested that she was taking um, Abilify and potentially one other medication and even with those medications had experienced decompensation within the detention center prompting her third admission um, to Winnebago. And it's after that third admission she's been there ever since? She's been there since, correct. Um, doctor, do you have any rough estimate as to how many evaluations you've done related to suitability for conditional release? I don't know the exact number. Uh, any rough estimate over your career? <clears throat> Give or take a hundred. Okay. And you're certainly aware of the statutory standard the court looks at in terms of um, whether or not someone poses a significant risk of bodily harm to themselves or others or significant property I damage? I do. Yes. You're very familiar with that standard? I am. And in this case, what did you find regarding Morgan? It's my opinion that uh, release to a less restrictive environment at this point would constitute a substantial risk of bodily harm to herself, others, or to a property. Therefore, I'm not in support of her conditional release at this point. And I would assume in the course of your career, the roughly 100 times you've done this, there's varying degrees of, well, have you found people that are suitable for conditional release? Yes. And there's varying degrees of how close or not close they may be based on your evaluations? Yes. And in evaluating Morgan, is this to you a close call or how would you characterize that? In my view, and especially given um, the knowledge of her particular circumstances, all of the records, the observations that I made during the clinical interview, this was not a close call. Not close in that you definitely believe conditional release is not appropriate. Correct. At least at this point. Correct. I don't have any other questions, Judge. All right. Thank you. Attorney Cotton, cross-examination. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. I want to start by asking you about a comment uh, you made a few minutes ago about Morgan's psychosis. Um, you, 
You're aware of the, uh, the history of the offense in this case, correct? Yes. And you know that it happened two weeks after Morgan had turned 12? Yes. Right? Um, and would you agree that um, 12 is uh, a young age to be able to diagnose a condition like schizophrenia? Yes, and as you might recall, back in the initial competency phase, uh, when I did my evaluation, I was reluctant to put such a label on her. Um, and you've, you've recognized that from the early stages that it's difficult for somebody uh, pre-adolescent or beginning the adolescent years to have that diagnosis. Correct. Um, and that's because sometimes children and young, young individuals have fanta fantasy thoughts that aren't a mental health issue, right? That's correct. Now, um, you had indicated that Ms. Geyser's psychosis, you used the phrase, was well hidden from those around her. Um, and uh, you would agree that there hadn't been, from your knowledge of the situation, there hadn't been lots of signs to her family members that Morgan had a severe mental illness. Correct. Um, Out, if I could just explain, outward yeah. signs. Right. There may have been internal things within Morgan that she was grasping with, right? Right. And as I understand it, once um, searching through her bedroom, through journals, um, drawings, her computer, uh, some of those outward signs became evident. They just were hidden and that they were not readily observable to those that were around her. Right. So um, and that, that's related to insight, isn't it? Would you agree that that's that? An, Insight refers to a person understanding their condition, right? Right, an understanding of their own condition, correct. Right, that they suffer from a disorder, and first they have to understand they suffer from a disorder, right? Correct. And what that means and how that affects them, right? Correct. And then the person also has to understand what they need to do to treat the disorder. Would you agree with that? Yes. What medications might be appropriate would be one way to treat a condition, right? Correct. So. Um, and schizophrenia isn't some abstract condition that's that's newly developed. Would you agree with that? Right. Well documented for, for decades, people have known about schizophrenia, right? Right. So this isn't some novel uh, mental health condition that isn't commonly seen, right? Right. And you would agree that most doctors, um, most psychiatrists and people in that field have treated, have experienced treating that condition. Would that be a fair assumption? I would be careful in saying most. I think that people who specialize in severe and persistent mental illness certainly have. Uh, there are clinicians that don't deal with mental health in that severity. So those persons would have less experience um, dealing with a schizophrenia spectrum disorder. Okay. And schizophrenia spectrum disorders are treated with medication, right? Yes. In conjunction with other therapeutic methods as well. Right. The medication controls the symptom. Oh, my bad. Yes, uh, medications in conjunction with other therapeutic methods. Right, the medication controls the uh, hallucinations, the auditory and visual hallucinations, right? That's the hope, yes. And um, then the therapy addresses the coping aspect of things. Correct. And the educational dimension of teaching the person how they cope with the condition. Correct, and the therapy can also help an individual with insight, learning to differentiate between the hallucinations, the delusions, the <coughs> aspects that are not a part of reality in comparison to what actually is reality. And psychiatry or the practice of psychiatry involves um, testing medications to see how an individual responds to them. Sometimes, yes. If the medications are not effective right away, there is a um, process of trying different methods, or I'm sorry, trying different medications at different dosages, at different combinations to find the most effective combination that would help both um, alleviate the symptoms, whatever those symptoms are that the person's experiencing in combination with managing any negative side effects that come of that, such as weight gain, um, tremors, other uncomfortable physical um, attributes that the medications cause. So in many cases, it's trial and error. It can be, yes. And um, when it appears, when the doctors realize that one medication isn't effective, there's other medications that they might try, right? Correct. And, and that's sort of the history of what's happened during Morgan's placement at Winnebago. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Doctors have tried medications and they're trying to find the right combination. Yes. Um, your interview with Morgan was, um, in your report, uh, you only did one report for the uh, conditional release phase, correct? Yes. 
and that's your November 20th report, right? Yes. Um, and when you identify a section called procedures, that relates to um, uh, the things that you did and considered to reach your conclusions, right? That's right. Um, and would you agree that the only uh, person that you interviewed was Morgan herself? For this particular yes. evaluation? Yes. And that was the interview on October 26th? Correct. So um, about three months ago or so, about nine, a little over three months ago, right? Correct. And uh, you didn't do a follow, you haven't done a follow-up interview with Morgan by phone or in person, right? No, I have not. Um, and you did review records at um, Winnebago, you reviewed Morgan's set of records, right? I did. Um, but you didn't speak with her social worker, right? I did not. I relied upon the documents generated by all of the individuals who have had contact with her throughout the uh, stay of both this admission but also the previous admissions as well. Okay. And so you, you didn't do a telephone conversation with Jesse Andrews, her social worker who's been with her from early on, correct? No, I just relied upon the records, um, the documents that Ms. Andrews created while doing therapy with Morgan. Okay, and um, all the records, correct me if I'm wrong, but the records and materials you reviewed would have been up to October 26 of 2017, or did you review records after October 26? I cannot remember in this particular instance if there were some records that were s submitted by fax <clears throat> after I saw her. Regardless, it would have been records up to around that time. Um, certainly not after I had submitted my report. Okay, so the report is submitted November uh, 21st. <clears throat> uh, you agree with that? Um, I've got it dated November 20th, 2017. Okay, so um, for sure nothing reviewed after November 20th, right? Correct. Okay. And the, uh, you would agree that um, Morgan has been at Winnebago now for uh, about, um, well, since June of 2017. Is that, she's been there consistently since June of 2016, right? 2016, correct. So a year, about a year and a half or a little more than a year and a half, right? Right. Now, um, when you interviewed Morgan, um, she had been just transferred from Peter Sick Hall over to the Choices Unit, right? Yes. And that's um, taking her from a medium security unit down to a minimum security unit. Yes. And, um, and that can be an overwhelming experience for a person. It can be. And because of that, staff closely monitor um, individuals while that adjustment is happening. So there tends to be increased contacts, observations, note taking. Um, within that time frame to ensure that a person is well supported during that transition. Okay, so now we're uh, we're about three months out from that transition now, right? Yes. Um, and so, would you would you agree that the the three month history be, from her transition is important to know that information? It could be, however, given these particular circumstances, given the totality of information that I have um, related <coughs> to her functioning over the last several years information through that three month period would not necessarily change the opinions and conclusions that I'm offering here. And that's not what I'm asking. Okay. I'm not asking you to change your conclusion right now, okay? okay? Um, what, what I'm, all I'm asking is, would you agree that, that um, that's important information to examine? I guess for what purpose would be my response. So to, well, for well, the purposes wanna, of I wanna, my evaluation, uh, my evaluation encompassed all the information up until that point. Um, so for the next evaluation, it certainly could be and would be reviewed. However, um, given my opinions offered back in November, I used all the information that was available at that time. Right. Um, so I'm going to just ask the same question again. Um, you would, would you agree or disagree that her progress now over the last three months at a minimum security unit is important information to consider when reaching a conclusion? Certainly could be. Okay and you don't have any independent knowledge today whether you've reviewed anything past uh, the only thing you can say is that perhaps you reviewed materials up to november 20th right correct that's exactly what i did and um and i had asked you before whether it can be overwhelming for a person to move to a minimum security unit and you agreed it can be right absolutely um and that's why staff members will pay close attention to a person during that time right <clears throat> 
Now you talked about Morgan's history um, uh, sometimes where she had uh, decompensated, let's say, um, when moved to a less restrictive environment or a less restrictive setting, did you say? Uh, what I had said in my report is therapeutic and supported environment. Okay. So um, what you were talking about is the times that Morgan has been transferred from a therapeutic environment back to the jail, right? Correct. Those are the only two places she's been. Right. So um, there's a history of her uh, deteriorating when she goes to jail, right? Right. Okay. Um, and that, that would be expected with a person who has schizophrenia. They would be more... Um, they ought to be in either a therapeutic environment. They ought to be in a therapeutic environment. Would you agree? I think it's beneficial to be in a therapeutic environment. I don't know that it, I would say it's expected for an individual to necessarily experience the compensation. What we would hope is that a person is um, well managed in terms of their medications and has effective coping strategies that they would be able to independently handle any kind of stressor thrown at them in the community or also being transferred to the detention center or jail. Um, but you would hope that an individual has that psychiatric stability to warrant the change in the environment. Do you know whether they offered Morgan medication in the jail? I can just go by what the records say, and it appears that she was taking, I believe it was Abilify um, and another medication prior to coming to the Winnebago Mental Health Institute on this third admission, which started in June 2016. <coughs> Um, you agree that when you reviewed the records in this case, um, the records showed that Morgan remained compliant with taking her psychotropic medication? Yes, she has always been compliant with her medications. And you, would you agree that there has, there's no history of her acting aggressively towards her uh, others or towards herself during her admission? During her admission, correct. Or during her stay in the jail? As far as I know, correct. <clears throat> and. There isn't any evidence, uh, would you agree that there isn't any evidence of a psychiatric decline uh, now that her environment has been changed to the Winnebago Hospital? I don't know that I would agree with that. Uh, what the information suggests is that, especially during um, her co-defendant's trial, she was experiencing significant stress. And as part of that, the records show that she was uh, displaying and complaining of acute anxiety, acute depressive symptoms, um, as she did during the interview with me, she had reported um, post-traumatic stress syndrome um, spectrum issues related to flashbacks, um, wanting to avoid anything that reminded her or triggered her of these um, memories of the actual offense. And so the information reviewed suggests that actually she did experience um, deterioration in that part. Um, there's also indication to suggest that she was experiencing um, times that she appeared preoccupied by internal stimuli. Um, and then also, as I had indicated, she had reported to me that she was experiencing still this voice of Maggie. Um, you would agree that uh, in your report you indicate that Morgan has demonstrated increased psychiatric stability across the course of her current hospitalization? Absolutely. When in comparison to uh, my first contact with Morgan back in 2014, to where she is at now. It's undeniable that she's experiencing, experienced gains through her use of psychotropic medications and gains through her treatment that she's experienced and taken part of at Winnebago. That being said, she still has a ways to go. She's still an individual who requires um, intervention. Right, um, and there, you're aware there's a Chapter 51 uh, uh, that's in place against her, right? I am. I believe the records had mentioned that there was potential that um, the commitment end date was coming up um, as to whether or not that had been renewed. I don't know anything about that. And you're familiar with that process and how that can be renewed every every year, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. Okay. And you're aware that it's, it has actually been renewed repeatedly in Morgan's case, right? Yes. Um, and you're, and you're aware that as part of a Chapter 51 process, uh, people can be given uh, medication orders, right? Right. Where they're, they're forced to take medication. Right. And nobody's ever had to force Morgan to take medication. Right. As indicated, she's always been compliant with taking medications. <clears throat> now, during Morgan's time at Peter Sick Hall, um, she participated in individual therapy one to two times per week, you noted? Yes. And attended therapeutic groups, you noted? Right. Um, and, and this is a unit for adult offenders, right? Correct. So Morgan's not with um, 
other individuals her age. Correct. Um, she hasn't been with individuals her age during the entirety of her placement. Are you uh, aware of that? With exception of when going back to the detention center and there are other um, youths. But correct, it's Winnebago, the units that she's been on, it's um, adult oriented in part because of her um, legal status. Now you, um, <clears throat> you indicate in your report that Morgan has um, insight into her illness. Do you still agree with that? Yes. Um, do you agree that she understands what her symptoms are and can verbalize them? She can do it to some extent. Um, where her insight appears to be lacking is in terms of when having conversation about with her about how would you know if you're deteriorating and what would you do. This is where, um, as I previously had testified to, she had put uh, a lot of the onus of making that determination to persons outside of her, so specifically her mother, saying that her mother would be able to identify that and would take appropriate action. Um, do you have a lot of experience working with 15-year-olds who are um, have schizophrenia? I do a number of evaluations related to juveniles. Um, I don't provide treatment to juveniles. Um, how many evaluations of a 15-year-old girl with schizophrenia would you say you've done? I couldn't begin to estimate. I don't know. Are you able to... Uh, estimated as the state had asked before about your total number? I don't think I could in this instance. Do you think it's more than 10? I don't know. I've evaluated a number of youths over um, since I have been at the Mendota Mental Health Institute in 2008, um, some being females, some having schizophrenia or psychotic spectrum disorders. I, I don't know how many that might be. Would you, uh, would you agree that Morgan can name the medications that she takes? Yes. And she's aware that she takes those medications in conjunction with schizophrenia and major depressive disorder. Yes. And um, Morgan has expressed a desire to remain medication compliant. Has she not? She said she, that she does not like the medications and wishes she doesn't have to take them. However, she does recognize that the medications are important for her to continue to take, especially because... Um, she doesn't want to experience deterioration in her mental health. Right, and she told so she's told you she wants to continue taking the medication. Right. Because she doesn't want to go psychotic, as she put it to you, right? Right. Okay. <clears throat> now, the goal here, um, uh, would you agree that the goal in general is for Morgan to become symptom-free? That's the, the long-term goal. Ideally, yes. <clears throat> and... Um, and that, that can take time because psychiatrists have to try different medications on a person, right? Correct. It's different for every individual. And um, Morgan has been symptom-free now. Um, well, you, you indicated she told you she had heard a voice or voices a couple weeks before you met with her, right? Right. In addition to both by way of my observations, self-report, and the medical records indicating um, a number of other symptoms that she was experiencing outside of those immediate positive psychotic spectrum um, symptoms. You said it was a few weeks before your contact. That was what you what you had said. The voice of Maggie. Yes. Yeah. And um, uh, are you aware that her treatment professionals, her social workers, indicate that the last time she heard voices was August? Are you aware of that? No. Now, um, since Morgan had been transferred to Choices about uh, three days before you viewed her, she hadn't um, earned priv privileges or had additional liberties yet. Isn't that correct? Right. She was so new to the institution or to that particular unit that she hadn't had the opportunity. Um, as mentioned, she had just met with her treatment team in the hours right before my contact with her. Have you had a chance to review any of the... Um, other doctors' reports that have been done for conditional release, or have you not had access to that? I have not. Okay, so you're not aware of any other doctors' findings in this case? Right. Um, do you believe that it's important for Morgan, given her age, to have um, contact with other adolescents? Is that important for her development? I do believe that that would be developmentally appropriate, and that's a challenge that Winnebago is going to face, likely, if she is not conditionally released, um, to provide developmental and age-appropriate treatment and opportunities for her um, in conjunction with the psychiatric treatment, the therapeutic groups. Now, is there an adolescent residential treatment facility that's available for girls in the state of Wisconsin? I don't know. 
um, you're aware that such a facility doesn't exist within Winnebago, which is one of the problems they have, right? I'm aware that Winnebago has a unit for civilly committed youths um, that includes females, but that Morgan's legal um, status prevents her from being on that unit. Oh, and, and Morgan can't be in that group because this is a criminal case and she's under a different type of commitment. Right. Her legal okay. status prevents that transfer. You're referring to the Chapter 51 process if there was no criminal case, right? Correct. Um, do you believe that Morgan, um, uh, are you fami familiar with any residential treatment facilities that might exist for Morgan? I don't know offhand. Did you look into any before you prepared your report? I did not for this purpose, no. Um, did you look into any treatment foster homes that might be viable alternatives for her? I did not know because it is my opinion that the placement that's most appropriate for her at this point is Winnebago. <clears throat> and where, where would Morgan go next after Winnebago? Well, it's my understanding that if she were to be granted conditional release, the Department of Human Services has um, 60 days to develop a plan that would include discussion of what would be appropriate for her placement next whether that's her return to her family home, whether that is a placement in a, what we would say a step-down facility like some kind of community-based group home, residential treatment center, uh, but that is a determination that her conditional release treatment team and the Department of Human Services and Winnebago staff would work together during that 60 days to, um, to determine. And um, do you think it would be beneficial, beneficial for Morgan um, to have a mentor upon her discharge to help with her development of skills? Eventually, yes. I think that would be important. <clears throat> Do you think that um, it's important to have as an aspect of Morgan's treatment stress reduction and mindfulness training? Absolutely. And um, do you believe that when Morgan is ultimately released that she should have individual psychotherapy sessions? Absolutely. And actually, I would stress that that would be a method that is um, very important for her because throughout her stay at Winnebago she has had access to and has participated in um, individual psychotherapy and she has identified that as being the most helpful aspect of treatment to date. As opposed to being in groups with a, a mentally ill adults, right? Right. It can be un uncomfortable among other things for a 14 or 15 year old to be with mentally ill adults. It certainly can be, however I don't know that that explains um, the totality of why she prefers individual treatment um, versus some of the group treatments. <clears throat> now your your conclusions start on page 10 of your report, is that fair to say? I just peek. That's correct. Um, I don't think it's really necessary to have it on the screen, but Rob can bring it up if he wants. Um, so in, in, in your findings, um, you have your report in front of you, correct? Right. So in your findings, you had um, talked about the fact that Morgan is showing increased psychiatric stability over the entire course of time that she's been at Winnebago. We've already established that, right? Right. And you've said that there's, in your opinion, there's room for continued improvement, correct? Right. Um, at least as of when you saw her, you were convinced of that, right? Right. Now, um, you indicate in the last sentence of your first point that Morgan continues to work closely with her treating psychiatrist in an effort to find an effective medication regimen that balances symptom management and negative side effects. Is that your one of your findings? Yes. So um, that's what you're what you're saying is that it's important for her to continue working with the doctors, right? Right, and she's done a good job doing that um, throughout the course of her stay. She's been very vocal and willing to comply with any recommendations that her psychiatrist has made, um, has had a collaborative relationship with um, that person. Um, and so, so that first paragraph relates to your concern over the symptomology, her continued experiencing psychotic symptoms, right? Right. And then in your, your second paragraph, or your second finding, um, is really sort of the same thing, right? Because you're, the second finding, you're talking about your concern that she still has psychotic experiences, right? Right, and what I did essentially is to break it down into kind of these two groups of symptoms. So you have these outward psychotic spectrum symptoms, um, which would include the voice of Maggie, um, but also you have this additional um, 
these additional types of symptoms that appeared to be interfering with her adaptive functioning at that point, which included um, the subjective distress, the depression, the anxiety, the flashbacks, um, the sleeplessness, the avoiding being alone because of having all of this tumult happen at any point that she was not being distracted um, by outward stimuli. It would be concerning to you if Morgan weren't feel, showing remorse, right? Yes. That would be a problematic sign, right? Right. And when people, um, and you've talked about her remorse, but that's in part what's probably contributing to the depression. Is that a fair assumption? Absolutely. The, the recollection of events and appreciating what she did. Absolutely. And that causes the, that and legal proceedings certainly can cause anxiety in a 15 year old, right? Absolutely. Um, things like depression and anxiety, those conditions in and of themselves don't require institutional placement. Not necessarily, although in extreme circumstances it can, um, including if a person's experiencing depressive symptoms that are so severe that they're suicidal or engaging in self-injurious behaviors, that would be an individual who requires institutional care. That okay. is not Morgan to right. specify. Okay. So the de her depression and anxiety doesn't require hospitalization in this case, right? I don't know that I could tease it out like that. I think that's too simplistic because what we have is a human being and the entire package is what you see. All of these symptoms are her. These are all symptoms that are working together to, um, at the time of my evaluation, was significantly adapt, significantly impairing her ability to even get through the interview with me, uh, was impacting her ability to get through day to day at the institution uh, without tearfulness, without crying, without, um, having these um, moments where other people were noticing something's wrong. Um, do you think it would have been a, a better idea to interview Morgan um, maybe a few weeks after you had interviewed her so that she could have had time to adjust to her new unit? It certainly could have. However, my opinion isn't based on just that single, inter that single interview. Uh, my opinion is based upon the totality of all the information that I reviewed which included information prior to her current Winnebago stay, but also months worth of documents related to her institutional adjustment, her symptoms, her changes to her medication regimen, her participation in groups and therapy and education. So it's too simplistic to break it down into, my opinion is based just on that interview. It's not, it's based on all of that information combined. Um. You indicated in your third point that Morgan is not yet done processing painful memories and emotions from the offense, right? Right. Um, that's, I mean, really that dimension of things is, is going to be a lifetime process, wouldn't you agree? Likely, yes. Okay. So it's not something that we can necessarily just address through a medication. That's more of a therapeutic approach, right? Um, what I would think is that it would be a combination of both the medication approach and participation in different kinds of therapies, different modalities of therapies to be able to address the severity of the symptoms that she's currently experiencing related to that. And ideally, as she continues to progress through those kinds of treatments, um, the intrusive nature of that will impact her less, um, such that she would be able to get through a, an interview um, related to conditional release. Um, you're not aware of whether she was able to get through the other interviews with the other people that saw her, are you? I don't know. Okay. Um, now, in terms of Morgan's, uh, you testified before about you pressing Morgan on part of the release plan aspect of things, right? Right. Um, so she's 15 years old, right? Right. And um, presumably, will, if she leaves Winnebago, will either live in a, uh, either at home or some other environment, right? Right. Um, and Morgan understands the idea that she could live with her parents, right? She, she knows her parents and has a relationship with them. Do you agree with that? Right. Um, and they appear, you haven't talked to her mom, but you're aware that her mom has been involved in uh, every aspect of this treatment process. Yes, her family is very supportive. Um, and heavily involved. Yes. Um, and you would agree that, um, well, I want to understand what you meant by pressing Morgan. So uh, were you, were you, Describing to her the fact that um, people in Waukesha might recognize her, is that something you were discussing with her? That was part of it. Um, when I'm saying pressing, it's not enough for an individual in these kinds of evaluations to say, I don't know, and want to move on to the next question. That's not a sufficient answer in my perspective. Um, so to ask questions of, well, what kind of stressors might you face? I don't know. Well, can you think of anything? 
Um, it's not enough to just leave it there. So to con when I say press, um, I'm not bullying in any way, I'm just asking following up questions and challenging questions that she might not have thought about, including there likely is going to be stigma related to her because she is a, this has been a very high profile case featured in the media and she might face backlash to that and that's a realistic thing that she needs to think about prior to being released. And, and that, that backlash could be more severe in a community like Waukesha where the case would have more publicity, right? It's hard to know. Did you talk to her about that, about where physically she would go upon her release or did you not get to that point? She had expressed belief that her parents had um, been thinking about moving to a different community to try to get away from, in part, the st stigma of this particular offense, but also knowing that um, the victim lived in the community still to, so, to provide some separation. And that, um, depending on the type of community they move to and its proximity to Waukesha, that could impact the level of attention she might have, right? It certainly could. <clears throat> thank you. Those are all the questions I have. All right. Thank you. And you redirect. Doctor, would there be a certain length of time for which you would like to see Morgan on a stable medication uh, regimen before you would consider conditional release? I don't know that I can put it into those specific terms of there's an X finite amount of time that we would need to have her be symptom free because it's individualized. Every person does respond differently to medications. Um, what I would want to have her do is to display psychiatric stability for a prolonged period of time um, in absence of um, in absence of hearing voices if possible, in absence of crying spells, um, being able to confront some of these issues related to her offense um, instead of having flashbacks and doing avoidance. I would want her to be able to do some of these things prior to being conditional release while also displaying the ability to maintain the psychi psychiatric and behavioral stability and decreasing amount of staff supervision and support. And as indicated, she's had very close supervision up until this point, and it's unknown how she might respond um, should she be released into the community, especially given that in the past, when moved to less supportive environments, it's not gone well. Would the time that's gone by, say in November, December, and January, in your opinion, be enough to show prolonged stability? No. Um, if Morgan had indicated to staff or employees at Winnebago that she was symptom free since August, that would not be consistent with what she told you, is that right? Right. And it wouldn't be consistent with my observations. How is that? Um, that she was actively experiencing symptoms during the moments, not psychosis, not hearing voices, but she was actively experiencing distress. She was unable to effectively pool her psychological resources to get through our interview. Um, that was very atypical in doing a conditional release evaluation. Um, then in addition, all of the records suggest that she had been experiencing increased depression and increased anxiety around the time frame of this. So it's not enough just to look at those psychotic spectrum symptoms. That's just part of her whole entire clinical presentation. So at the point that I was meeting with her, she was not symptom free. Thank you. I don't have anything further, Judge. All right. Thank you. Any further cross? No, we need uh, a few minutes for our next witness, Your Honor. All right, so then uh, is, is Dr. Lundboon under a subpoena? She is. She may be excused by the state. Are there any objections? Um, no, just Judge, we had I had talked to the state about not having a sequestration order um, in this case because it could be valuable for witnesses to hear the opinions of others, so she's welcome to remain if she'd like. All right, very good, but otherwise you're released. Thank you for being okay. here. And then you wish to take a, a ten few minutes, minutes recess? recess? Yeah. We'll take about five or ten minutes. Okay, thank you. I note that I had a, I did receive uh, Joseph Lautner's letter that did come through the uh, system. I had an opportunity to read it during the, uh, during the break. From the, so I'm, the procedure is as I expected, but as what we're doing is states presenting any witnesses they have, then the defense will present 
witnesses they have, and then I'll hear arguments. Is that the process from the yes. city and from the defense? Right. All right, very good. Now we're here seeing a, uh, we'll hear a witness at this time who's appearing by video. True? True. True. So who is being called? This is Dr. Kenneth Robbins, Your Honor. Okay, Dr. Robbins, uh, I can see you. Can you see me? I can, Judge. And I can hear you as well, so that's good. And you can obviously hear me. I can. So where are you located? I am uh, in Vallejo, California. The, I'm at a hospital. Uh, all right. But you're there as a treating physician or as a treating Correct. psychiatrist, true? Correct. All right. I'm going to ask you to, uh, to stand and uh, raise your right hand. That's fine. You can stand normally, and we'll, I see your hands up. My clerk's going to uh, swear you in. Do you swear okay. to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. I do. Thank you. Then thank you. You may be seated. <coughs> and then I'm going to ask you to state your full name and spell your last name. Kenneth Robbins, R-O-B-B-I-N-S. Thank you. Now, as part of the, uh, this is a video conference uh, to present the testimony. It's an appropriate way to present a witness that's, that's unavailable. The part of the system that we're using, it's a new system. Uh, so this is the first time it's been used certainly in Waukesha County. Uh, so be aware if we have any uh, quirks in how it's presented, we'll, uh, we'll pause and take care of those. With that, I'm prepared to begin. So Dr. Robbins knows in order to have a more clear picture of you, I'm going to turn and look the way I'm looking. I can see you better looking this way than I can if I look to my right. So with that, uh, then Attorney Kugler. Yes, uh, good morning, Dr. Robbins. Good morning. Um, we're here uh, on the Morgan Geyser case. I'd like the um, court to hear a little bit, though, about your uh, training and experience as a physician and your background. Could you take us briefly through that? Sure. I uh, went to medical school at the University of Michigan, uh, did a residency in internal medicine, and then a residency in psychiatry, and I'm board certified in both. I've been a clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin for many years, going on 35. Uh, I have had a number of different positions over the years, uh, including uh, teaching at the University of Wisconsin, medical director at the Mendota Mental Health Institute, medical director for Rock County. I've been teaching psychiatry in the law and have had a private forensic practice for many years. And I currently also work as chief clinical officer for Adventist Health uh, on the West Coast. And is that a full-time position on the, on the West Coast? It is not a full-time position, no. Okay. And that's where you are today, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And um, so is that about one week a month you are uh, working in California and then three weeks a month in Wisconsin? Is that how I understand it? That's exactly right. Now, you know Morgan Geyser, correct? I do. And you have experience with her, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that experience with her. How, when did you first come in contact with Morgan Geyser, and, and can you take, take the court through your background with her? Sure. I interviewed her initially. Uh, and I'm, I'm reading from my report that I assume the judge has a copy uh, that's dated September 17th of this 2017. Yes, we all I have actually, that. I'm sorry? Yes, we have that report. Thank you. Okay, good. So the first time I interviewed uh, Morgan was on June 10th of 2014 uh, at the Washington County Detention Facility. I interviewed her a second time, December 4th of 2014 at the Winnebago Mental Health Institute, a third time on June 6th of 2015 at the Washington County Juvenile Detention Facility, and then most recently on August 28th of 2017. And that was that at Winnebago Mental Institute? 
Correct. The most recent one was at the Winnebago Mental Health Institute. Okay. So how, uh, when you first met Morgan and interviewed her on June of 2014, what was the purpose of that? Uh, so the first time uh, was, I think, related uh, to whether she should, whether Morgan was competent to stand trial. So it was a competency evaluation. Correct. And what, what were your findings at that time? I did not believe she was competent to stand trial at that time. Did um, eventually Morgan's competency get restored? Correct. Were you involved in that treatment? I was involved in that evaluation, yes. But not the treatment to restore her competency, correct? No, no, that took place at the Winnebago Mental Health Institute. All right. Now, when you first met Morgan in June of 14, how, how, did, you, how did you find her at that time? Uh, Morgan was quite psychotic at that time. Morgan uh, believed, for example, that uh, Slender Man was real. She believed a number of fictional characters were real, uh, including characters uh, involved in Harry Potter books. Uh, she um, believed that she had special powers that would allow her to transport her mind to wherever she wanted it to be. So she didn't have strong feelings about whether she ended up uh, in a institute or in a jail. She felt like wherever she went, she would be fine. Uh, and um, Morgan was very frightened about what Slender Man might do to her family if she were to somehow betray Slender Man in her mind. Now, let's talk about how, well, first of all, the reason you most recently saw Morgan was to uh, furnish the court an opinion on her suitability for conditional uh, release. Is that right? Or discharge? Yeah, I guess, I guess I'm not exactly sure since she hasn't been found, since she hadn't yet been found not guilty by reason of saying, I guess the question was, what is the most appropriate placement for Morgan at this time? Yes, you're right. But it's similar to the kind of evaluation you do for a conditional discharge, true? Yes. Okay. Now, how fast forward from 2014 through to uh, 2017, how, how did you find her uh, more than three years later? A dramatically different person. Morgan had become insightful and aware of what she had done, was extremely remorseful and guilt-ridden. She had been sufficiently depressed as she realized what had taken place that she had been, actually been started on antidepressants at with the Winnebago Mental Health Institute because they were concerned about her. She um, was very clear that the treatment she had gotten with the medications was critical for her. She did not want to stop the medications. She felt like she was now thinking more clearly and the thought of committing some other act uh, as a result of her psychosis was clearly very frightening to her. Uh, a fairly remarkable insight uh, for somebody of her age. Why, what, what do you credit that transformation? What do you credit to it? Well, uh, I think Mark Morgan's a bright child um, and the treatment has been very effective. When you uh, interviewed her, did you uh, do any? Did you do any testing of her? No, no formal testing. That's usually something psychologists rather than psychiatrists might do. And that's right. You're a psychiatrist, which is a medical doctor. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Now, um, how did you find her uh, placement? her current placement at Winnebago Mental uh, Health Institute. Did you, do you find that to be a good placement for her? No, no, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a safe placement and she's gotten appropriate treatment, but no, I think in terms of her 
uh, growth as a person and her continuing treatment, I don't think it's an appropriate placement. It, do you know whether she's around other adolescent um, adolescents at Winnebago? So that's really the core of my concern about the current placement. She's uh, she's on an adult unit. Uh, she is uh, by far the youngest person on the unit. She doesn't have any peers. Uh, whatever schooling she gets has to be done individually, uh, and there's really no uh, ability for her to socialize with with peers why is that important well it's a critical part of growth for any any person during their adolescence to learn how to interact with peers to get a sense of who they are and how they get along with peers but particularly somebody with the kind of illness that morgan has uh, interpersonal interaction with peers is a really critical part uh, of uh, the, of her development and of her uh, capacity to, to do well despite her illness. Have you run in, in, the, in your many years of um, practice in this area, area, have you run into cases such as Morgan's where a person has been hospitalized for so long before a sentencing? No, this is unique. How is Morgan doing, uh, from your knowledge, with uh, compliance with medications? So I, from my knowledge, which includes uh, t keeping in touch with Winnebago staff, including this week, uh, Morgan has been very compliant, uh, just as she told me. She recognizes the importance of the medication, and there have been no concerns or issues with regard to her compliance. So you followed this case since June of 14, including as recently as this week? Well, in, in, including talking to Winnebago staff this week, that's correct. Okay, and uh, do you, can you tell us which um, staff people you might have spoken to this week to get an updates? Well, they asked me not to, not to specifically okay. say their name. All right. I don't mind, I'd rather protect them. Okay, that's fine. Um, So if, if Morgan, uh, is there any, anything in your opinion as a psychiatrist uh, who knows Morgan's case as well as you do, is there anything to be gained by keeping Morgan uh, continued placement at, at Winnebago? Um, well, so I, Winnebago has done an excellent job of providing treatment for Morgan's psychotic illness, uh, and they have kept her safe and the public safe for this for an extended period of time, but she has reached a point in my view now where her psychotic disorder is very well treated and her own personality has reemerged and uh, she is an empathic, kind, compassionate, bright young woman who is very remorseful about what's taken place and I don't believe there is anything that she would gain by remaining on an adult unit at Winnebago at this time. Are there any, well, you said one uh, thing that Morgan really needs is to be near other adolescents. That's important for her development, right? Correct. And that won't happen at Winnebago, is that true? That's true. And are there, uh, does, is one of the goals in treating uh, somebody, uh, an adolescent with uh, a severe mental illness is to help them become a productive citizen? Exactly. And does that, as good as they've done at Winnebago, are they um, equipped or geared to work on those issues? Well, Morgan's reached a point where they don't have the ability to provide her a standard schooling experience a peer group to learn how to interact with. Uh, and so there's some very basic and very important parts of adolescence that she is missing out on by remaining at Winnebago. Why, why are these important parts of adolescence? Well, in part because 
um, you know, that's really what adolescence is, is learning how to be an adult, learning who one is, learning how to, uh, how to in, uh, be part of interpersonal interactions with peers, how to learn how to adjust your behavior. And then schooling is obviously a really critical part of being an adolescence and preparing for some kind of adult life and adult career. Uh, and when one has schizophrenia, this kind of socialization is particularly important. Schizophrenia really has three components. There are the positive symptoms like hallucinations and delusions, uh, and certainly Morgan has experienced those symptoms, but there are also cognitive uh, symptoms, and there are what are called negative symptoms, which are things like uh, apathy and a decrease in energy and a decrease in motivation. And to avoid those, the best thing we know about are to improve interpersonal interactions and give someone a meaningful existence. Okay, so socializing is part is an important part of that uh, to prevent negative symptoms. Is that what I understand? Exactly, it's an important part of the treatment of schizophrenia. Okay, um, what about this cognitive? Um, area that you're talking about. What Can you explain that a little bit? So we know that over time uh, there are changes in uh, the way the brain uh, develops related to schizophrenia. This is a physiologic, biological illness. Uh, and we believe that the deficits that one can get with schizophrenia can be minimized uh, with education and socialization. And in the education that Morgan's getting at Winnebago, do I understand, is a couple hours a week, just uh, somebody comes in and works one-on-one -on -one with her. Is that right? So I don't know exactly how many hours, but I know it's limited and it's just one-on-one. -on -one. That's correct. Well, Morgan is with other, uh, uh, she's with women right now at Winnebago, isn't that true? They're adult, adult women, that's right. But they're adult yes. women, right? Um, that's correct. Uh, does, a, does my understanding that an adolescent wouldn't uh, mature the way she should if she is exposed only to adult women? Well, certainly um, one doesn't develop a peer group. Uh, it, it's a very different kind of relationship with, with adults than it is with your peers. Now, she's on two antipsychotic medications, is that right? That's correct. Oh, and what are those? Uh, Abilify or aripiprazole and haloperidol or haldol. And it's far as your knowledge, how her compliance has been great with taking her medications. Is that true? Yes. And she's presently taking those in an oral form. In other words, she, she takes them by her mouth. Is that right? Correct. Um, are there other forms of those uh, medications that are more long lasting or more long acting, I guess would be a better word? There are, uh, particularly if one is, has any concerns about compliance, there are long-acting injections available, both for haloperidol and aripiprazole. Okay, so for, uh, if, if somebody was concerned about Morgan's compliance, which we have no evidence that she doesn't comply, but if, if, some, uh, if the court or somebody was concerned about that, um, we could be looking at doing the injectable forms, right? That certainly ensures compliance and the injections for haloperidol are given uh, approximately every two weeks, uh, for aripiprazole approximately every four weeks. Okay. Now is Morgan um, also on antidepressant? She is. Well, do you have a, an opinion as to why she started taking an antidepressant. What happened? So, so what the clinical notes that I, so I have the clinical notes from Winnebago and from what the clinical notes suggest is that Morgan, as her psychosis uh, dissipated, she became much more self-aware, much more insightful 
about what had happened, what she had done, and she became overwhelmed with guilt, remorse, and sadness. Is, um, is there anything wrong with her having become uh, insightful and uh, depressed, filled with guilt? Are these things abnormal or normal or, or something in between? I think for somebody who is compassionate, somebody who has empathy, it's what we would anticipate. It's, I guess I would say it's normal. So when you see her now uh, with this insight uh, into what happened before, um, how, does, how does that compare or contrast with how she was when you first met her, doctor? Oh, it's a dramatic uh, turnaround. Uh, when I first met Morgan, she was, she had a pretty hard shell. Uh, she did not appear to have any clear empathy for uh, the young woman who was victimized in, in this matter. She, uh, I think, felt like she had done what she had to do to protect her family and that it was unfortunate there was a victim, but she didn't appear to have a great deal of empathy for the victim herself. Um, and she had very little insight about what had led to her behavior, and that all is, has really transformed. And it's important for somebody with a mental illness to have insight, isn't it? Well, it's important for compliance. I mean, you know, it's, um, you know, it has, as in Morgan's case, it has its good news and bad news. It has, you know, made her very depressed and um, sort of overwhelmed with what she did. Uh, but, but of course, in the end, I think it will be important and, uh, and I think in the end it's helpful to her, but she just has to uh, uh, learn to understand her illness, that is, which is what she's working on, and, and accept uh, that it was the illness that led to this behavior. And I think for her, it has motivated her to be compliant with, with the treatment. Was Morgan, uh, did she cooperate with you during your uh, most recent evaluation with her? Was she yes. willing, did she sit through it willingly? Yes. Okay, did she ever uh, uh, ask to terminate the interview or in some way become non-compliant with ...understands the benefits of taking medications, correct? Correct. And has also indicated to you that she, based on that understanding and based on what she did in the past, that she would never think of stopping to take her medication. That's basically what she said, correct? Correct. It's also probably fair to say, though, that you've interviewed a number of people over the years that have said something similar to that when they were trying to get released to the public or get in the equivalent of conditional release. Conditional That's fair. Charge, I should say that then later when they got out in, in the community, stopped taking those medications, correct? Correct. Now, one of the things I wanted to ask you, you you indicated in your report that the last change to her antipsychotic medication was May 24th of 17. And Correct. We have had some indication that some of her other medications were changed, that in June they added Topamax to her medication regimen, and July increased the dosage of it, and then in September started tapering down her dosage of Celexa. Are you basically saying there's no significance to her treatment of those medications because they're not antipsychotics? Well, I don't think they have any bearing on her dangerousness. Those are really medications that were to help manage her, the mood difficulty she was having as she became uh, insightful. So she was depressed is basically what we're saying. Fair, that's right. She was depressed. And isn't it true that, at least on some occasions, depressed people do commit serious crimes that involve bodily injury or even death to themselves or others? Well, certainly severe depression is associated with suicide risk. That's, that's correct. Uh, but I think what we're talking about here is, is Morgan's, primarily her danger to others, although fortunately for this, she never became suicidal. I know one of the things we talked about is her lack of socialization in her current placement. Now, when you interviewed her, 
in September. That was before her current placement at the facility, correct? Correct. She's been moved since I saw her. And in spite of that, in her new placement, you're saying she still doesn't get any socialization with peers, and by peers we're talking about other individuals at least close to her age, correct? She is still on an adult forensic unit. And are you aware that she is at least getting some level of socialization by communicating with individuals through her computer? I am. I, you know, I think that's fairly minimal, but yes, I think I am aware of that. Now, I know you weren't present, and by present I mean like you are now, when Dr. Lundbaum testified before you. She talked about interviewing Morgan October 26 of 2017, and Morgan saying at that time that within the last few weeks she'd actually had her audio hallucinations that she was talking to, to Maggie. Were you familiar with that? So Maggie is a long-standing hallucination that Morgan has experienced. She's had that since she was a little girl. Um, when I met with her and what the clinical staff at Winnebago have told me is that since before I saw her, Maggie has been gone. Uh, there was a little bit of Maggie still there when I spoke with her, but this was, this was uh, almost a crutch. It was almost hard to tell if this was a real hallucination. She, she can't remember ever being without Maggie, although in my most recent conversations with Winnebago staff, they tell me that even Maggie now is gone, that there are no remaining psychotic symptoms. Right, and I just so want I did talk in my, I'm sorry, I did talk in my report about there being minimal psychotic symptoms, and that's what I was referring to. There was still some question of whether Maggie was, was there, but that uh, the Winnebago staff have assured me that that is no longer the case. So I just want to, I'm pretty confident I know what you just said, but I'm just going to verify it for my own knowledge. You're saying that when you spoke to her in September, there was still some indication that she might be communicating with Maggie, and that since that time, you've spoken to staff at Winnebago, and they've indicated to you that that's no longer an issue. Is that a fair way of putting it? It is. And I guess one final thing. I know you've talked about your belief that interaction with peers and socialization are important for her treatment going forward, correct? Yes. But you've also acknowledged that, at least in terms of the statute that we're dealing with, that's not an issue that the statute refers to. The statute simply refers to that risk of harm to themselves or others or serious property damage, correct? Correct. No further questions. Uh, further correct. Yes, uh, doctor, you you understand that if um, at the point that Morgan would be uh, placed outside of Winnebago, she would be monitored for probably decades by the Department of Health Services, right? Correct. And so if there would be some sort of deterioration, uh, wouldn't it be their job along with others to um, replace Morgan in a more restrictive setting if it was necessary? So their job will be to monitor her compliance and her symptoms and her acceptance of whatever other treatment they deem to be appropriate and if for whatever reason she's not cooperating or the symptoms return, it would be their responsibility to make sure she was in a safe place. And with that, with the knowledge that that uh, that she's going to be monitored for a very long period of time, doesn't that lessen any kind of risk uh, in Morgan's case? I think it does dramatically, although again, what I'm recommending at this time is not for Morgan to return home yet, but for her to be in a secure facility where she would get psychiatric treatment and continue to be monitored as she just starts to transition, but most important, uh, to, continue, to have some kind of education and peer interactions. Right, to be placed in, in a place where she can be with other adolescents. With, exactly. With this treatment that you've outlined. Okay. Yes, thank you, doctor. 
That's any, all any further cross examination? Nothing further. All right, thank you. Doctor, I do have one question. This is Judge Bourne. I'm looking at your report from uh, September 17, 1917. On page five in the, your conclusions, section three, uh, the, uh, the, the last sentence uh, says, quote, her most recent significant medication change was less than four months ago. So at this time, it's my recommendation that she remain hospitalized for further treatment, end quote. Now, I read that in light of your testimony today. I conclude that your recommendation is that she stay at the uh, at Mandora in an inpatient setting, although you found that if an appropriate alternative setting was located by Mandora, you'd recommend that she be placed there. Am I reading that right? Yeah, yeah, Winnebago, but yes, exactly. I think you are reading that right. I, my, my change really has to do with the fact that she's an adolescent, that she's done extremely well, and that I am not recommending what would normally be a conditional release. I'm not recommending that she return home. I'm recommending that she stay in a secure facility, but one that is more uh, amenable to treatment of adolescents. All right, thank you. Any, uh, any further questions for Dr. Robbins based upon what I asked in his answer? No, Your Honor. No. Anything from the state? No, sir. Well, Dr. Robbins, thank you for appearing today by video. I appreciated your courtesy in that regard. We'll then disconnect the video connection. Have a good day. Thank, thank you, Dr. Robbins. Thank you for allowing me to participate. With that, then uh, further witnesses. Yes, we'd call Jessica Andrews. I think she's here. The ma'am, stay standing. Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guys? I do. Thank you. Then be seated. Uh, pull up to the microphone. It's the bar with the red light. And state your full name and spell your last name. Jessica Andrews. Andrews spelled A-N-D-R-E-W-S. Uh, you're soft-spoken. I'm sorry. Jessica Andrews. A-N-D-R-E-W-S. Very good. That's better. Thank you. All right. Mr. Cotton. Good morning, Ms. Andrews. Uh, how are you? Good morning. Good. Thank you. Um, before we begin today, um, I just want to establish what your role is. Um, what are, what's your current, where do you currently work? I'm currently employed at Winnebago Mental Health Institute. What is your job there? My current job is I'm the Director of Forensic Services. Okay. And you know, you know Morgan Geyser, correct? Correct. Um, and you understand the per you understand that you've been called as a witness today to speak about her um, privileged medical information. Correct. Which would otherwise not be disclosed publicly. Correct. Is there anything that you need to ask Morgan before we begin this process to proceed or no? I would ask Morgan's consent for me to disclose privileged information that has been shared during individual psychotherapy sessions if asked on the stand. Okay, Ms. Geyser, are you okay with that? Yeah. Judge record. Yes, sir. And you understand you could say no. Yes, sir. And when you say yes, that means that Ms. Andrews will respond to questions and make disclosures of private of things you've said in a private setting. Understand yes, that? Is that okay? Yes, sir. All right. Do you need any more time to talk to Attorney Cotton? No, sir. All right. Thank you. Well, I'll take the consent, and I'm satisfied that uh, she's consulted with her attorney and that based upon my knowledge of the case and the the long-standing uh, representation by Attorney Cotton that her consent is a knowing voluntary consent. You may proceed. So you are the Director of Forensic Services? Yes. Um, does that mean you run Winnebago, or what does that mean? I um, oversee the programming in two of the patient um, buildings on the facility, some of which are um, two of the buildings would be Peter Sakal and Gordon Hall, and both of those buildings have forensic unit and civil units within them. Okay, are those the medium security units? Peter Sakal is the medium security unit. Gordon Hall is a minimum security unit. Okay, we heard earlier, you've been here this morning listening to the testimony, have you not? Yes. Um, so. Gordon would be same, the same as Choices, basically. Choices is a unit located within Gordon Hall, yes. Okay. So, uh, did you, are, are you currently a, a, ther are you a therapist by training? 
I am. Um, my background is that I am a licensed clinical social worker, and I was first employed at Winnebago Mental Health Institute as a clinical social worker in 2004. Since that time, essentially, I have been working there as a clinical social worker. In August of 2017, I received a, a, a job change where I became the director of forensic services. A promotion. Correct. So you have a master's degree. I do. From where? Uh, UW-Madison in social work. Okay, and, that's what, and then you became an LCSW. Then I became an LCSW. And you worked as an LCSW for 13 years until your promotion. Correct. You're still licensed that way though, right? Yes. Um, as a license, as an LCSW, were you given the opportunity to work with Morgan ever? Yes. W when did that happen? When Morgan uh, was first admitted to Winnebago Mental Health Institute for Competency Restoration in August of 2014, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, sure. Uh, when she was first admitted at Winnebago Mental Health Institute in August of 2014, I was assigned as her social worker, um, and I provided her with competency education as well as individual psychotherapy. Um, so on the competency side of things, you helped Morgan uh, get to a point where she could process what was going on? Yes. And then on the individual psychotherapy side, you were providing what type of services? Um, we were w working towards um, understanding her illness, uh, working towards accepting her illness, symptom management, um, a, a variety of, of things in the context of individual therapy. Okay. Did you, um, so have you worked continuously with Morgan for three years or was there any interruption in that? The interruptions in my work with Morgan would be when she was discharged back to the juvenile detention center. Okay. However, during each of her admissions to Winnebago Mental Health Institute, I was assigned as her social worker and individual therapist. Okay, and then we've heard some testimony today about Morgan having been currently placed there since June of 2016. You've been her therapist since that time, straight? Yes. Um, and even once you became director of forensic services, did you continue with Morgan? I have continued with her providing her individual psychotherapy. I am not her assigned social worker any longer. Okay, but be, I, I'm assuming because you have a relationship with her, you've remained involved? Yes. Um, how is your relationship with Morgan? Um, I would say we do have a strong therapeutic alliance. A therapeutic alliance, did you yes, say? Yes, a therapeutic alliance, a strong therapeutic relationship. Uh, do you feel that Morgan trusts you? I believe so. Does she uh, dis disclose things to you? Yes. Now, um, you've seen Morgan at her worst and at her best. Would you agree with that? Within the context of her hospitalizations, yes. Okay, you've seen her when she's been uh, untreated. Correct. Going back to 2014. Yes. Um, and, and you've heard uh, the two doctors testify today, haven't you? Yes. There's been discussion of Morgan improving uh, substantially over the course of her time at Winnebago. Would you characterize it that way? I would. How would you describe her, um, her improvement? Well, let me take a step back. Until recently, Morgan was in the Petersick unit, right? Yes. What in Peter Sick is a medium security adult unit? Yes, it is. Is it is it a highly uh, secured environment? It's our most secure environment in our hospital. How did Morgan do? How did, has Morgan done over the year year or so that she was there? Um, she has consistently adhered to all of the unit and hospital rules. Um, she has remained medication compliant. Um, she has remained active in her treatment. There have been no um, major behavioral problems, no acts or threats of aggression towards others. What about towards herself? Has she uh, attempted suicide? No. Or been a risk of danger to herself that you've seen? She has not. Okay. Um, and well, she's been the victim of some things from other people, hasn't she? Yes. Some aggression by other mentally ill adults? She has. And. Um, she, how does she, how has she processed those situations? Um, it was, I would say, rather traumatic for her. Um, there was an incident where another patient physically aggressed towards her. It appeared to be rather unexpected. Um, she met with me. We discussed it at length. She did a, 
uh, very um, appropriate. She was very open and processing her feelings about that. Um, she did relay in sessions following that occurrence um, that it helped her uh, come to terms with possibly how the victim of her crime may have felt when she was hurt. So she was able to take her, her experience of being physically uh, victimized and relate it to her, uh, her being the perpetrator of something? Yes. Um, do you consider that a mature, uh, was that a mature way of responding to that? I consider that a mature way of responding to that, yes. Do you think of Morgan, does Morgan appear to be a mature 15 year old? She does. Okay. Um, during her time at, at Peter Sick, when you've worked with her, um, has she ever been uh, forced to take medication? No. Is that something that could, that can happen to people who are there? If there is an order to medicate, that is something that potentially could happen. Now, um, at the beginning of um, her medication process, Morgan had not been medicated before, right? Correct. Um, and she, she didn't know what that would be like to take medica medication. Would you agree with that? I would agree. Um, and when you, when you discussed that with Morgan, how did she respond when you told her that she would begin, begin this process? Um, initially, she really verbalized that she didn't feel she needed medications. She did not want to take medications. But that should that be ordered or be an expectation of her treatment, she would be compliant with it. Okay. And did that prove to be the case then? It did. Um, and do we know for sure that she takes her medication or is this something she could be hiding? Um, our, our procedures with administering medications is that they're administered by our nursing staff. And um, when Morgan or any other patient approaches the cart, they're handed the medication by staff and they are to take the medication right at the cart and there's two staff observing. Okay. Um, why couldn't Morgan, why was Morgan kept in Peter Sick Hall for, um, for such a long period of time? Why didn't you transition her down before uh, recently? Uh, that was a result of her legal status. She was um, placed at our hospital under a Chapter 51 commitment order with this pending criminal case, which would essentially be as though it's, it's a legal detainer, essentially. So as a result of that, and because she was charged in uh, adult court for a felony, um, she needed to be placed on our medium secure unit. Which is, is that what her needs required, or is that just the protocol at the facility? That's the protocol based on her legal status. So um, she's, she's been at Peter Sick Hall, she was at Peter Sick Hall longer than therapeutically she would need. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Um, had it not been for that exact legal status, she would have transferred to a minimum security unit sooner than what she did. But if Morgan were showing concerning features, you, you wouldn't have just transitioned her to, to minimum, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, you mentioned Chapter 51. I want to just talk about that for a minute. Have you worked with Ms. Geyser's Chapter 51 providers? I have. Um, and to this day, are they still involved in her life? They are because she is still under the Chapter 51 commitment. Are you, if, if, if we were able to um, take away the criminal case, and this were just a Chapter 51 placement, uh, would, would it be recommended for Morgan to transition out of Winnebago at this point? Yes. Um, but because it's a criminal case, then it has to be a different procedure. Correct. And you're waiting on the judge to make those determinations. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> now, Morgan was taken from, or moved to minimum security. I w I'd like to know a little bit about how she's done since she moved over there. You heard Dr. Lundbaum's testimony? Yes. Did, is it true that Dr. Lundbaum visited Morgan three days after her transfer? To my recollection, I believe that's accurate. Was that a um, difficult time for Morgan when she had been transferred? Morgan at that time was very relieved that she was able to be transferred to a minimum security unit. She had spent a great deal of time in our medium security and the move to, to a minimum secure unit allowed her the ability to be able to have some more freedoms um, such as more um, increased access to our courtyard, um, other things, um, the use of an iPod, those kinds of things so she could listen to music. So um, there were some more freedoms that she really embraced. The state talked about a computer. Is she using a computer? She does not have access, any internet access. No. Okay. 
They, you heard the questions about her chatting with people online? Then that's not accurate. She it's is not happening. Absolutely not. We don't allow that uh, for anyone. Okay. She doesn't have uh, instant messenger where she's chatting with people? No. She uses a telephone. Okay. Or writes letters. Or writes letters. Old school. <laughs> um, so, Ms. Geyser, um, going back to what you were saying before, over at the um, minimum security unit, she has more privileges. Yes. And um, was that that was there an adjustment period for Morgan to get accustomed to the new facility? Um, somewhat, because there is for most people. It certainly is. A, a, there's a different milieu and adjusting to having access to different things as well as a different peer group and uh, a new treatment team. In my opinion, I do not feel that that was a difficult adjustment for Morgan to make. Okay, she's made it pretty well? Yes. Were you present for the Dr. Lundbaum interview? No, I was not. Did you speak with Morgan immediately after that interview? I cannot recall exactly. I, I believe I spoke with Morgan shortly after the interview, I do not know if it was the same day. Okay, there was some talk. You heard the talk about Morgan having uh, been very emotional during that interview. Yes. Um, and crying and not being able to to um, handle it all. Correct. Is that something that you recall taking place at Winnebago and that you worked with Morgan on? Yes. What happened? Um, Morgan has at times had difficulty discussing, um, you know, that the day of the crime, the events surrounding that. So it, she has become tearful at times. She does address that in sessions. Um, I feel she, she uses those therapy sessions um, very appropriately to process those types of feelings. And, and does she process those feelings more effectively when she's in a therapeutic environment with people she trusts? Yes. Okay. Have you had any, have you had trouble recently with Morgan being able to uh, discuss the circumstances of the offense? I. Well, I would ask you to find trouble. She, she um, presents in session as very open and willing to talk. Very seldom do I ever feel like or I need to have to ask her questions to get information from her. She's very open in sessions. When there's something troubling her, she discusses it. Okay. Um, so in the, when she does discuss the events of that day, yes, it's very upsetting to her, but she processes it uh, openly in session. And um, as a as a mental health professional, it, it's is that to be expected that somebody would have trouble processing something like stabbing their friend? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and coming to grips with the fact that it was mental illness that caused the crime. Yes. Or caused the behavior. Yes. Um, now, when Morgan's been in the minimum security unit, has she continued to take medication, or did she become resistant? She's continued to be 100% compliant with her medications. Um, Dr. Lumbaum had talked about Morgan having, about there being a history of decompensation when Morgan has moved to other environments. Did you notice decompensation here? What I've noticed, although I never worked with Morgan and I was not involved with her during the time she was placed at the juvenile detention center, but assessing her immediately upon return to the hospital um, from those placements, I would say it did appear that her mental health um, did decompensate somewhat in the environment of the juvenile detention center. Okay. Um, so referring, focusing on the medium security to the minimum security, has there been a deterioration there? No. Has there been an improvement, or how would you characterize her uh, transition? Um, again, she has transitioned very well to that living environment. She does not present any longer with symptoms of psychosis. She does present with some depression, and she does experience uh, what she describes as flashes, which, which I would attribute to symptoms consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder. I do not believe that's in relation to a change in, in a medium to a minimum secure unit. I believe it's a growth of insight on her part, um, that she has a better and a deeper understanding of what had happened and what this means for not only her life, but the lives of the others that have been affected. Um. Was it, was it difficult for Morgan when she learned that uh, Anissa Wire was going to be brought over to the Winnebago Mental Health Facility? Yes, it was. Why was that difficult for Morgan? Morgan expressed to me in session that she, she felt upset about that outcome 
because she felt that the co-defendant was taking advantage of Morgan's mental illness. Okay, she, from what she had heard, she felt like her genuine mental illness had been uh, taken advantage of? Yes. And um, did you work with Morgan on how to process that? Yes, and we continue to do so. And uh, will the facility keep uh, the co-defendant separate from Morgan? I cannot comment on the co-defendant. Okay. So um, Morgan was uh, expressed that concern um, about, about Anissa. That's what you feel comfortable saying? Yes. Now, um, did Morgan make any comments about uh, Anissa having the ability to stop the offense, or did she not talk about that? Morgan has shared that periodically in therapy sessions, um, having the, the belief that Anissa was the one person who, who could have stopped this from occurring. And didn't? And, and didn't, in Morgan's, in Morgan's words, yes. Now, um, when Morgan was, um, during the time that she's been in the minimum security unit, you said Morgan has no psychotic symptoms. Correct. She does not present with psychotic symptoms at this time. So uh, is that just based on self-report, or is it, are there other things you look to? Self-report and observation, not only by myself, but other staff involved in her care. So uh, are, are, is everybody at the facility a trained professional? Within the capacity of what they're working, yes. Okay. Well, when you say observation, is that by, are we talking janitors or are we talking mental health professionals? We are talking mental health professionals. So okay. on her treatment team, she has a psychiatrist, therapeutic services staff, which are occupational therapy, recreational therapy, occupational therapist assistants, registered nurses who have mental health training, and then also our, uh, uh, our psychiatric care technicians who uh, work on the units right, right with the patients as well. So okay. observations between all of them. Over the course of now um, 90 days or more than 90 days? I would estimate, yes. For the, for the placement in the minimum, yes. right? And going back before her placement to minimum, well, let me just ask it more, more specifically. Do you have, can you pinpoint when the psychotic symptoms were effectively eliminated from the hospital's perspective? I would estimate it was August or September of 2017 when the psychotic symptoms were gone. Does that correspond with a, um, with a medication adjustment, or what does that correspond with? Well, while I cannot comment specifically on her medications because that's out of my scope of practice, I would say with medication adjustments that occurred last um, late winter, early spring, that really began to alleviate a lot of the uh, hallucinations and other psychotic symptoms that she was experiencing. Um, but so... Okay. Um, and is it fair to say that um, mental health professionals don't just rely on a person's self-report, they also look at how the person is functioning and acting in deciding whether they're responding to things. Yes. Um, people might be, you might be asking somebody a question and they might be looking up at the distance and it appears that they're seeing something, right? Correct. Or they wheel their head around and it appears they're hearing something, right? Yes. So when you say that Morgan is psych, uh, has no psychotic symptoms, you're referring to the constellation of observations by all the professionals as well as Morgan's reporting with you. Yes. Has Morgan been honest in general with her reporting on her mental health symptoms? I believe her to be consistently honest with her reports. Do you find her to be a deceptive young girl? No. Um, when you say you find her to be honest with her self-reports, does she come to you when she's struggling with things historically? Yes, she does. She will seek me out. Um, she will ask for increased sessions. She will ask staff uh, to relay a message to me so that I can see her and help her. And does Morgan have uh, connections to family members or have they abandoned her? She has a strong connection to her family. Okay. Do, do, you, do they visit her and interact with her? Very frequently. Is it important or unimportant for family to be involved in a 15-year-old's mental health treatment? It's very important for any family member to be involved in any loved one's mental health treatment, um, especially in the case of somebody who's so young, she's 15. Yes. Does, does this family, from what you've seen, let's talk about her mother. Have you had contact with her mother? Yes. Um, does, does Morgan's mother appear to be actively concerned about her daughter's well-being? Yes. Does she strike you in your interactions as a mother who is um, hyper attentive to her daughter's condition? I don't know if I would quantify it as hyper attentive. I believe she's appropriately attentive. Okay. Um, 
And does she strike you as a mother who tries to minimize this whole process and uh, in any way? No. Does her mother appear to be somebody who's resistant to the idea of medication? No. Does she appear supportive? Yes. Um, and I ask that because I, I, I want to know whether this is a situation where professionals are working with Morgan, clearly making progress with Morgan. And then there's, are there setbacks when Morgan goes and interacts with her family? Do they appear to be counteracting your, your approach? No. Um, how often does she get visits? Um, I'm going to estimate two to three times a week. And those are um, a combination of supervised and unsupervised, or are they all on how are those? They're supervised um, in, in a more of a large group setting. So they come during, during our regular visiting hours in that building. So there are staff present in a large room where a variety of patients are visiting with their families. Um, who's the youngest per is Morgan the youngest person at your facility? Morgan is the youngest person on her living unit. At the, in the minimum security area? Yes. And was she the youngest person at the medium security, Peter Sakal? Yes. Um, are there, and she's with women right now, right? The unit she's on now is a co-ed unit. So the unit has men and women. Okay, does she, but the living arrangements are women with women, right? The in, the in the hallway that they are in, there are her room, she does not have male roommates, but there, there are men who reside in the same hallway. They share a day room, they do not share rest rooms. Okay, and are all the people in this unit people who share her legal status? Yes. People who have been found uh, not guilty because of their mental illness? Correct. And people who are awaiting disposition? Some of them are, so they are people who have been allowed the opportunity to be on our minimum security unit. Um, so they are provided the treatment to work towards a conditional release. Okay. Some of them may have petitioned and maybe their conditional releases are pending. Got it. So if, if judge were to order some additional period of time for Morgan to remain uh, committed, she would remain in that unit that she's in? Yes. Um, and can she earn privileges in that unit? She, she would be able to, yes. W Privileges where she'd be able to be released into the community? Eventually, yes. Um, like going to Walmart and things like that? That is a privilege that the patients on that unit can earn. Okay. It's based on how, uh, it's based on behavior, I'm assuming. It's, it's based on, on behavior. It's based on um, engagement in treatment. It's based on um, medication compliance, sometimes length of time. It, they do need to establish a great deal of, of trust, and all of those are always staff supervised. There would never be a patient in the community without staff. Okay, Morgan has developed trust with you, for example, right? Yes. But she's got a new team now, right? Yes. So that team has to develop the trust with her? Yes. Uh, is Morgan, you talked about engagement and treatment. Is Morgan engaged? She is. Um, there was some discussion about individual psychotherapy. Is that something she prefers over groups? or? It, it seems to be. What I would point out is due to the length of time that Morgan has been hospitalized, she has been through a number of our groups, oftentimes more than once. Um, so when she was in Peter Sakal, she ran through our cycle of groups several times. She has offered the opportunity for some new groups while she's in Gordon Hall. Um, however, she's she. She honestly has done a lot of learning and a lot of excellent group participation. Okay, so it's covering a lot of the same stuff? A lot of them are. What? And it's with adults though, right? It's with adults. Okay. Um, educationally, is Morgan go she doesn't go out to school, right? Correct. So a, some educator comes into the environment and teaches her for a couple hours a day? Yes, um, one of our adult um, educational teachers oh, does we... come see her individually. Uh, and that's for three and a half hours a week she receives that. So an, a, a normal 15-year-old, an average 15-year-old who wasn't in the facility would be going to school eight hours a day or so, right? Correct. Morgan doesn't get that. Correct. She gets about a half hour per day if you average it out over a week, right? Yes. Now, um, and do you agree with the characterization of her as being uh, somewhat bright? Yes. Okay, so and education would be important for her. Does she seem to excel in it? Yes. Um, have you witnessed any, any um, 
Is Morgan, after her transition, did she become more violent or more dangerous since her transition? No. Do you, um, do you see Morgan as a dangerous person to others or herself at this state? No. Um, if, if the judge were to order her release to the community, is that something that you would support, having worked with her? I would believe that Morgan no longer requires an inpatient hospitalization at the current level of intensity she's receiving it. I do not view her at this time to be a danger to herself or others or property. Um, so you think her the needs that she has don't correspond with the intense services of Winnebago? Not in such a secure environment. And I do need to say I, I have not completed an assessment of risk for you know future dangerousness or in any other setting outside of Winnebago Mental Health Institute. That's something you could do? That's something that, that possibly could be completed. In, in the case where somebody is, is committed under an NGI and petitioning for a conditional release, the independent evaluators would really be the ones to assess that rather than the facility. And would, would those evaluators speak with, with you as Morgan's treating professional to get your input on things? Some of the evaluators do. Okay. Um, based on your uh, clinical experiences with Morgan and your personal inter interactions, um, you, you haven't seen any evidence of her being a risk to the public at this stage? No. Um, is provided she's taking her medication? Correct. And, have you, and you haven't noticed problems with that during her stay at Winnebago? Not whatsoever. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Ma'am, I, I, and this may have been my misunderstanding of Dr. Lemelon's reports, but she talks about Morgan having contact on a daily basis with a youth who presently resides in Texas, and I guess I assumed that meant a computer based on something else, but how is she having that contact? Through telephone and letter writing is how she communicates with those outside of the hospital. So, so she has no access to a computer? She does not have any internet access.